right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Ryder, who is over on the other side of the country right now in South Carolina. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, and Andrew uh, trains entrepreneurs to lead. Um, he's a master leader in his own right and guides ambitious entrepreneurs on a captivating journey to find fulfillment in the art of serving clients, teaching them to become leaders in a world of followers. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how do you become a leader in a world of followers? And maybe um, let's baseline this, Andrew, a little bit. When you say leader in a world of followers, what do you mean by a world of followers? Yeah, so, you know, I... I was thinking about this the other day and I kind of had this epiphany. Um, you know, I, I went to school out in New York and uh, I don't know what it's like these days, but we'd ride the subway everywhere and it was always really busy. You know, there's people going everywhere and, and at least I thought it was busy until I saw this, um, I saw this video of subways, I think in Japan mm. and they have these workers out there who their sole job, you know, they have these big plastic, shields you know and their whole job is to push people in to fill up the train cars mm -hmm. and then so then the doors can close and you know then the train goes on to its destination and they step back you know and, and wait for the next train to come in and load up again and their job is to just fill the trains and, and keep the traffic moving during rush hour you know and I just had this thought you know this is kind of how a lot of people run their businesses mm -hmm. where they're trying to shove as many people as possible into, you know, into a launch, into a funnel and have this big launch, get as many people in. And then the train leaves the station and it goes off to wherever it's going. But, you know, one of the things you notice is the, the people who are filling the train, they don't get on the train. They just stay mm -hmm. at the station and fill up the next train, fill up the next launch. And you get into the cycle of just trying to fill up launches or, you know, get more people into your funnel. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, you miss what I think is one of the most important aspects of your business, which is that you're the one who's supposed to be driving the train. You're supposed to be on there, you know, inviting people to get in, you know, here's where we're going. Here's the vision that you're casting for your audience, you know, for the people who are a good fit. And then you're driving the train, you're taking them on that journey to that, to that place. And so I think that's what leadership means to me is, you know, being in that driver's seat and really casting that vision and taking people along with you for the ride instead of getting caught up in, in too much of the uh, just getting as many people as you can to, to get on board, you know? Yeah, no, it's an interesting, it's an interesting analogy. All right. Because uh, I think one that a lot of people can relate to, because as you say, when it's the rush to, and we're very, we're always numbers oriented, aren't we? I mean, we like, we want the biggest number. We want the most of everything. And you're right is that when you're focused on that part, you're not driving the train. You're kind of like just letting the train go on its own and have its own momentum and head in its own direction. Uh, and, and, and I think that's where, to, let's continue with this analogy. I think that's where a lot of businesses get derailed is because, <laughs> as you said, there's nobody driving the train really because the focus is on just getting more and more people in. And it takes some fortitude and it takes some courage to take a different approach, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, that's um, courage is a word that that really stuck out to me. You know, when I was reading a lot of books and studying, you know, I, I kept seeing courage come up as a theme in a lot of successful people that I studied. And, you know, I, I would highlight it and circle it. And I think, man, you know, I, I can't wait to finally figure out how to get some courage, you know, <laughs> but it's the thing about courage is it's more of a decision that you make. And same, same with being a leader is mm -hmm. it's a decision that you make, you know, you don't really need anything other than just to make that commitment to yourself or, or to your audience that, you know, this, you know, I'm going to step into this role. I'm going to hold myself accountable. I'm going to commit to these things and be that leader that, that, you know, your audience needs or, or that, you know, the leader that you need, you know, that's one of the things that, that I like to talk about is before you can lead other people, you need to be able to lead yourself. Yeah. 
And so it's a lot of those, you know, that's kind of the mindset side of things, but making that commitment and, um, you know, seeing it through then gives you the courage, a little bit more momentum, you know, to start leading other people as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, I mean, I think courage then is a byproduct of having a core set of values. So if you establish what your why is, what your purpose is, what your core set of values is, then if you are to be authentic and real, uh, it means that there will be moments when you need courage because you will have to stand up for those core set of values. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, you know, that's not always easy to do with, um, you know, especially seldom, like seldom easy to do. <laughs> right. It's, it's, yeah. You know, I was, um, I was recently reading a book called the game by Neil Strauss and, you know, it's not at all related to marketing. It's like a, it's about the pickup artist community in Los Angeles uh, mm -hmm. a few years back, but there's a, oh, there's so much good marketing and, and sales advice in that book, you know, if you're really combing for it. But one of the things that, that they said is that um, the strongest reality wins. And so in, in the pickup game, you know, they're trying to have a stronger reality than the people they're trying to meet. And, and you know, I think the same is true in, in marketing. You know, if you build, you know, like we've talked about, if you have that courage, if you have that strong set of values and you know what where you stand and why you believe what you believe you will have a stronger reality than you know someone who's trying to pitch you on the next latest thing that you need to be checking out and spending a couple grand on and then getting derailed like you say you know yeah because i do think and i and i think in many ways the the pandemic has forced this on people is a little bit of self-reflection but I really do think that that's what carries you through at the end of the day is if you have a good sense of why, why you're doing something, what's, the, what's your purpose, what's the purpose of what you're doing. Um, and, and that, and that, uh, and, and just coming back to that other point that you made about leading yourself, I think that's so incredibly important because um, a lot of people, when they aspire to, or they get into leadership positions, you know, first of all, they think, okay, now the, the foremost thing is I have to lead these people and like impress these people and everything. But to your point, like if you're not good at leading yourself and if you haven't figured out all these core elements, then you won't have the self-confidence or the self-awareness to be able to do it properly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, you know, I think a leadership role doesn't have to be, you know, we talk about courage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this overt, you know, kind of boisterous confidence. I'm not really that way. You know, I lead more by example in that, you know, I'm not going to jump on you and, and yell at you, but I'm going to sh show up consistently and do the right thing and try to set that example for you to emulate. You know, if you're trying to learn these skills or, or whatever it might be, you know, that's, that's more of my leadership style. And I, I think we're kind of coming back again to, you know, knowing yourself and, mm -hmm. and um, if you know how you are, then that's the best way to go about it rather than trying to be someone you're not. Well, I, I think that's the important point there um, is, is uh, Andrew, is trying to be something you're not. I mean, I think authenticity is incredibly important. And, and I think as well, and sometimes people confuse uh, confidence, as you said, like they think it's, oh, that means you have to be outgoing and overt and all of this kind of stuff. But no, it, it just means that you have to have, you have to be, um, what's the word for, you have to be secure enough in yourself to be able to interact with other people and to lead them. But the other point that you're making there is um, you can't communicate with everybody in the same way. You have to tailor your communication to how people want to be communicated or how best they receive communication. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, as, yeah, as much as you can in all of your one-to-one your -one communication to not only how you best lead, but how others best receive the information because the, you know that's that's one of the things that you can get trapped trapped up on too is it sounds it always sounds you know you know exactly what you mean when you say something yep. but to think about how other people hear the same words 
and uh, because they're filtering everything through, you know, their life experience. And, and, you know, it was something that like a couple of weeks ago, my fiance was asking me, you know, she was like, how, what would you describe? How would you describe what you do? You know, are you a coach or are you, you know, what, what word would you use? And when she said that, you know, I, I did not like that, you know, I, because I've had some really bad experiences with coaches personally. Uh-huh. So when, when she says, oh, are you a coach? You know, I don't want to be in that same category of people. And so it's, you know, it, it's really interesting and, and definitely worth reflecting on your marketing and your, your way that you pitch yourself is how, not only how you see yourself and how you present yourself, but how other people perceive that because there's, you know, it's easy to think that it's perfectly clear, but often it's not interpreted at all in the way that you think that it, that it is. No. And in fact, I mean, I think you're making a really good point here um, because uh, you know, you can come across in different ways to, to other people and that way you have to be very conscious of that. But I think there's a deeper point here as well is there you what you just outlined there is you have clearly have, some baggage right around coaching, you know, the experience that you had with coaches or whatever. We all have baggage. I think if you're going to be a successful leader, one of the most important things you can do is identify your baggage. Mm. And that comes back to, you know, what we're talking about, knowing yourself, knowing your values. And, and a lot of times your values can be generated through some of that, some of those bad experiences, you know, those, mm. some of those failures. It's, it's easy to think, oh, you know, those bad experiences, you just want to put them away and never think about it again because it was embarrassing or, you know, it was a failure or mistake, but really digging in, digging into that and, and learning from it and it, making improvements based on that, you know, that's where, that's where in my life, you know, where I think I found a lot of success was, was through those failures. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think that's why, I mean, you know, sometimes we, we look at failure in the wrong way and we look at these experiences in the wrong way. It's like some of the some of the people who maybe made life most difficult for us, maybe they were people who, you know, we look back on, we don't like particularly with what they've done. But if we analyze it, we realize that they were probably some of our greatest teachers, maybe not intentionally on their part, but the fact is that they did actually teach you a lot or you learned a lot from the experience. So sometimes it's good to look back at these things and sort of say, okay, put them in context and actually say, yes, I've learned from that. So now there's something I can bring forward positively as opposed to it, allowing it to be a baggage or a trigger for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and yeah, we do have a really, you know, at least in my experience, all my life and, at least until I started in online business, all my life was, you know, you're given a set of instructions and you follow the instructions and how well you do determines what grades you get or how much you, money you make. And, and it really sets this negative mindset around failure. And I think that sets people up for the wrong approach to success in, in life and, and in business because like we're saying, you know, a lot of the benefits come from making mistakes and then learning from those mistakes. And, you know, if I think back on businesses that I started that all failed, they, they really had the same problem in that I was really trying to, I was really trying to build this just money machine Mm -hmm. so I could, you know, make a whole bunch of money. Like you see online, you know, I was trying to do what I did in school and in, in jobs, I was trying to follow this set plan, you know, use the swipe files and, and follow all the coaching advice and, and just have this money machine that made it so that I could just retire early mm-hmm. and, you know, have an easy life, you know, and I kept making the same mistake over and over until I finally realized that that wasn't at all what I wanted. You know, what I wanted from life was not to just sail off into the sunset, but it was to have a purpose, have a fulfilling life, you know, engaging with other people, you know, doing a podcast interview Mm. or, or helping a client, you know, those types of human interactions were things that as when I was like hustling and grinding and trying to make this business machine work, you know, I neglected 
family and friends and health and all of these things that really truly mattered to me. And, and, you know, that's been a huge focus for me. And you, you, you know, you mentioned reflections of, of mm-hmm. COVID-19 pandemic, you know, that was the biggest thing that I learned really early on is, you know, I need to spend more time with family, more time with friends and, and really reorient my life in a way where I'm, I'm doing those things that I enjoy, not just trying to make a bunch of money as quickly as I can. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, and I think it's really, I think it's really important what you just said there. And I would just add one more thing to it. And that is, I think everybody needs to spend a little more time with themselves. And what I mean by that is absent all of the distractions, because I think we, we, we live in a culture today where a lot of people cannot operate on their own or cannot exist on their own, even for 10 minutes and half an hour, whatever, they have to have distractions. Of the, and I think that is really robbing people of the, of the opportunity to do what you just said right there is reflect on your life, reflect on your business, reflect on everything that's going on and make, and make changes or make good decisions based on that. A lot of people avoid that piece of actually existing with yourself or being alone with yourself. Yeah, it's... Um... It's really hard to do. And, you know, you just have that constant anxiety of where's my phone, what's going on in the mm-hmm. world and just checking it over and over again. And uh, you know, I read this book a few years ago. It was called The Road Less Stupid, I think, right. called, by, by Keith Cunningham. And uh, in it, he basically talks about he had this successful real estate business. And in, I think in, in 2008, he lost lost his entire business, lost millions of dollars. And he um, basically, as a part of that experience, you know, talk about learning from your mistakes. He realized that he could have prevented them all by, by this habit that now he, he writes about in the book and he is a strong advocate for, which is taking five to 10 minutes every morning. First thing in the morning, he gets up and he goes into his office and it's quiet. There's no distractions. And he gets out a notebook and a piece of, uh, and a pen and he just sets it there and he sits and he thinks. And if he gets an idea or something comes into his mind, he writes it down. It's not like journaling. It's just sitting quietly yeah. with yourself and thinking. And he, um, you know, he seemed to believe that he would have, he would have recognized the weaknesses in his business before that before they mattered <laughs> and he yeah. would have been able to fix patch the holes and fix it up before um, it was too late and, and so that was a really um, powerful lesson you know to to learn from someone else and not have to go through myself um, I, I have done that a bit I don't do it every day but yeah you're right finding that empty space to even just to meditate is uh, mm. really therapeutic and <laughs> helps keep you sane it, it does. And it's just like people avoid it. And I, I mean, I don't meditate, so I'm not going to. Um, I think that's great for people to do it. But you don't even need to go as far as meditating. It's just really just get some thinking time, put away all those devices. And I love what you just said about that. I, you know, the, that guy who was like sitting every morning quiet because you know, what, what's most people's morning routine? They wake up, they check their phone, they start looking at their their chosen news sites and None of these new sites are designed to inform you. They're designed to provoke you regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum. So, and then you go onto social media and that's all comparison culture and it's, and making people feel insecure and envious and all this. So if you think about it, that's a, that's a fantastic cocktail of negativity to start your day. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you bring up a good point about jumping on the phone right away and and that's just a recipe for a bad day Mm -hmm. Um, you know one of the things that I teach related to um, content creation um, you know content creation is a is a way to you know really get your thought leadership pieces and get your message out into the into the world and I was uh, I had been doing this for really successfully like for a couple of months. And I, I saw this interview with a, a neuroscientist and he kind of explained all the neuroscience behind mm. what I was doing. And uh, it all like, it, it clicked for me, but the, the, um, the idea of not checking your phone first thing in the morning is really, really important. Uh, if you're gonna be creating things or writing or doing any creative work, uh, as soon as you go into your phone, you start 
injecting other people's ideas into your yeah. head. Mm -hmm. And what you've been doing when you've been sleeping, and I'm by no means an expert at this, but uh, you know, this is this is what I do. Um, when you, when you when you're sleeping, you're organizing all the information from the previous day. You're making connections and you're breaking things down and and really getting to the base ideas. And so then when you wake up in the morning, if you start putting other people's ideas into your head, you're going to lose your own ideas. But if you can really sit down and focus and just start writing, and even if it's you know it's 30 minutes or it's two hours or however much you can do to just get that creative output going th those times when, you know, maybe you got some coffee, get a little caffeine going, you're focused. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when the magic happens. You know, that's when you start to just bring all these ideas together that you didn't even know that you had and generate so much momentum and interesting content. And uh, that's my favorite thing to do in the whole world. So <laughs> No, it sounds great. Um, listen, great place to finish as well. Listen, Andrew, thank you so much for your time today. All of Andrew's information is going to be below this video here. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah. So, you know, if um, you're interested in any of the leadership training uh, that I teach, you can check me out at andrewbrider.com. If you join my email newsletter, you, uh, I'll give you a, a training where I go more into the content creation side of things, as well as the positioning. Um, you know, those are two things that we didn't go super deep in here, yep. but uh, I've got like a 30 minute training there that's free that you can check out if you want to go deeper. Excellent. Well, listen, Andrew, thank you again. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.